Okay, moving right on to Daniel from Steakfish. We're uh, talking about Ethereum 2.0, Beacon Chain, decentralization, and transparency. So do I got Daniel here? There he is. Hello. Good to see you. Are you uh, you ready to you ready to go? Yep. Okay. The floor is yours. All right. So hi, I'm Daniel. I'm a protocol specialist at Stakefish. So I'll be talking about decentralization transparency on the ETH2 beacon chain. So yeah, so I, I guess like um, relative to other networks, it would be nice to have some transparency and insight into the state of what our decentralization is on Ethereum 2 beacon chain. So Stakefish is a, a proof of stake validator and we've been um, supporting Ethereum 2 deposits. So, so yeah, I'll be talking about uh, a few things. So first talking about some how we can get from raw data to reveal data, uh, going over some terminology, um, talking a little bit about transparency and understanding what that actually means. Um, some concepts of, I guess, security through obscurity and if that is actually something that's necessary uh, for the robustness and security of our networks. Um, the tragedy of the open source commons and the bystander effect and what that has to do with our decentralization transparency and whose responsibility ultimately it comes down to. And then I'll end with some sort of actionable insights. So yeah, I mean, we're very familiar with like the moniker um, don't trust verify, uh, but I think what actually happens is we oftentimes have to trust uh, in either infrastructure providers, applications, or even just uh, popular figures that kind of say, hey, this is the way that things are, this is the state, and then we are no wiser if we don't have the technical acumen to verify it for, for ourselves. So I think um, an important part is, right, right, anyone can definitely run a node, um, but do many people actually run the, those nodes? Like I would say very few of the, um, of the people who are interacting with Ethereum today do. Um, and so I think like that type of transparency and like these public networks uh, should be publicly available and accessible to, to anyone. Um, and, and that means that, right, there should be ways of being able to verify uh, easily. Right. And, and so like I say here, like vanity metrics aside, beyond that of like leaderboards for how much stake that you do control over the system, um, right? Objective transparency into that is important uh, for, for robust uh, security. And also to kind of maintain like the open source principles of our, of our network. So I'll, I'll go over some uh, terminology because I think there definitely is a, a bit of ambiguation between other proof of stake networks and that of Ethereum 2, uh, specifically with regards to what a validator is and what a validator is not, um, and then what service providers are and, and independent setups. So um, this comes down to like naming conventions. Uh, I, I think like with other proof of stake networks, if you're not familiar, you can, there are validators who are basically like the miners of proof of stake, uh, so to speak, and they, you know, accept delegations on your behalf and then, um, you, you know, you kind of get like a little award from that, from helping participate in the security of the system. Um, but I think when, and, and those delegation, delegation amounts um, on those different networks are uncapped, right? You can basically provide, send as many, as many um, tokens on those networks to a validator service provider. Uh, but on Ethereum, it's, you technically are able to send like an infinite amount of tokens uh, but the way that uh, validators are described is basically broken down into th uh, effectively 32 ETH, ETH increments, um, where a validator is determined by uh, uh, 32 ETH, right? And so it's somewhat capped. Also, there is kind of this concept of like, what is what and who is who, who are custodians, non-custodial non providers, custodial providers, centralized exchanges, independent setups, um, and then also, right, like certain, um, I guess, like white label agreements that happen between service providers and other service providers and service providers and even uh, non-custodial exchanges. 
Um, and, and this is just like an example from, I think this guy's, uh, Alex was from like the Tezos ecosystem that does have like a, right, as I mentioned, the un, uncapped delegation amounts uh, for which is attributed to a particular validator. And in this case, validator service providers. Um, and he's basically saying here, right, you know, Ethereum is showing there's like at this point in time in December 2nd, um, like 21,000 independent validators, but right, it's not actually... 21,000 independent validators, it's 21,032 ETH denominated validators that may represent 21,000 people or just a few of those. And you kind of get into these umbrellas that you kind of portion them off into where how many of those 21,000 are actually independent setups? How many of those are kind of denominated into validator service providers like, like us, Stakefish? How many does Stakefish actually control, right? Like the, the validation keys, the signing keys, obviously we, we are in a non-custodial and we don't hold your withdrawal keys. Um, and then how many of those are custodial exchanges um, or, or just custodians like, like Bitcoin Suisse, for example. So I think that like uh, that, that, that terminology disambiguation is important to kind of understand, right? Just like the pure raw numbers we see is, is not necessarily uh, w what is actually um, presented, right? And so, for example, I just broke it down here, right? Uh, this is one way to kind of look at it right now. We have individuals with independent setups. We have non-custodial service providers like Stakefish. We have decentralized pools like Lido and Rocket Pool. And we have custodial exchanges like centralized exchanges and then custodians like Bitcoin Suisse. And so within these buckets, I think we can kind of kind of come to a, a, a start of where this, uh, what decentralization actually actually looks like. Sorry about that. Um, and if we could bucket these, instead of the 21,000 amount, I think right now we actually have 70,000, but um, right, how much of those are kind of bracketed into existing uh, uh, service provider umbrellas? How many of those are individuals? And obviously from that, we can kind of see kind of unique amounts of where the decentralized action, decentralization actually is and what state we're at. Um, and that kind of come, leads into the concept of like trans, transparency, right? Obviously, like the scalability trilemma is decentralization, security, and trans, uh, scalability, right? Right. Um, and so, right, these are all important concepts. Uh, they're inherent to it. Um, and then I think perhaps with uh, the way that some people are familiar in terms of exposing their validators, let's say independent versus large service providers, uh, it's sometimes misunderstood as kind of anti-security. Anti um, and and I'll, I'll talk about that concept in a bit. But I, I would say that basically to sum it up, like transparency in favor over privacy is, is basically paramount to identifying the state of decentralization. The transparency that we can see at least gives us a, 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 a clear picture of state uh, of the state, and then from an understanding of a clear picture of the state, then we can kind of act on that and see what we can do from that, um, right? And this is basically an issue of, right, how many independents we have versus how many kind of pooled uh, providers do we have? So this kind of, so this leads into, right, the, the, the tragedy, I, I say, of like the open source commons, right? So, um, and, and the bystander effect. So, um, we, we can talk about, and as I mentioned, um, right, security through obscurity, where uh, there are these security engineering principles that kind of have, have, have talked a little bit about this, right? Like Claude Shannon, the information theorist, kind of says, like, you should have a, a default state of, like, the enemy, should know, enemy knows the system. Right? I think another popular one is, like, Kirchhoff's principle, where it says, like, a crypto system should be secure, even if everything about the system except for the key is public knowledge. And then Ross Anderson says, like, the security of a system should depend on its key, not on the des its design re remaining obscure. And, and I, I would say that these are, 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 are pretty good arguments against having privacy at all costs to obscure your setups or even expose, like, how much, you, how much of the system that you own um, ju just for that type of, uh, of privacy, right? Because I, I would say that maybe it makes sense for independence. But for large service providers, right, that's that's something that you get that we all have we as infrastructure providers 
should have been doing from from the beginning as and as a default, right? And and right, it's also having an understanding of like these open source systems that we should be under the assumption that the enemy all, all, always will gain familiar full familiarity with them. I think like a good example um, that we've seen, even like in the witty test net, like one of the consensus features is Johnny Rhea, like basically was able to almost trivially be able to, to dox certain people. Right. Um, and, and he was able to show that. Right. And, and so I would say that, right. This, this privacy that you obtain from security through obscurity is at the expense of decentralization transparency. And at the expense of decentralization transparency, you get, issues with actually understanding the complete state of the system. And if you don't understand the complete state of the system, then you can't understand like what you, what you may be able to do. Maybe you may have like an abstract or vague concept of, oh, right, a certain validator service provider has an enormous amount of, of control or influence over the current beacon chain network. Um, and then we should do something about it, right? But, but we can't just operate on this under this kind of like fog of, assuming things are, are going as well as they're wh where they're going. Right. Um, and, and so that's the kind of concept of like robustness. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. I must've redone that slide, but yeah. So the concept is right. At, at the end of the day, who is, who is responsible for these things, right? We're in, we're in like an open source environment. We're in public networks and public systems, but right. Uh, like, uh, Peter Gutman uh, had had given a talk on in like at, at KiwiCon in like 2007, where he was talking about like this design mentality of like bugs in the brain, right? Like uh, and and how these bugs and maybe applied to the our decentralized um, networks is sort of like centralization is the bug, right? Everyone also assumes that everyone someone else is looking at it, right? And 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 in the end, like the burden of Making sure that these things are uh, are are operating as they should, that decentralization is being achieved as as they should, it falls on like no one, and it also falls on 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 everyone at this at the same time. And so, because everyone is making these assumptions, we don't have clarity into the state, then then no one's doing it, right? And and, and so, uh, I'm not trying to like harp on anyone here, but like I think there are specific things that right we should be aware of. Um, and then we should be kind of pushing to make sure we have transparency, transparency into, um, right. And so I think, uh, Philip Monk is a developer, I think at, with the Urbit project has like a fantastic quote that, that I love. It says where sovereignty necessitates understanding. If you don't understand the system you're using, you don't control it. And if nobody understands the system, the system is in control. And in this case, like, what does that mean, right? If you don't understand the state of decentralization transparency, uh, or, or if you don't understand the state of decentralization and you don't, have to, you don't have transparency into it and you're making assumptions, then the people who are actually benefiting from it, or let's say uh, at, at risk or um, in power of being able to uh, benefit from it are perhaps large service providers like, like Stakefish it, itself, right? And, and, and right, the community and the ecosystem should be aware and maybe should may be more cognizant and demanding of their large service providers to, to kind of identify themselves or at least have some pressure there, positive mm -hmm. pressure, I would say. Right. And then again, right, you have like the don't trust verify moniker. Um, but the thing is that I, that I think we realize is, wait, what if we can't verify it? Right. Most people can't verify it. Um, and this type of decentralization transparency must be easy to verify and, and understandable. Um, I know I have like one more minute left, but I think I'll, I will definitely say like there are initiatives that are in place um, that need to have these dashboards that are open source, independently hosted, especially not by validators or validator service providers like Stakefish, right? Um, so there is no conflict of interest. They need to be credibly neutral and be treated as public goods. And for example, these are some uh, some initiatives that are going on, right? Beacon Chain is is developing some dashboards to support this. Nansen is as well. There's community initiatives that Elias from Bison Trails is doing, um, and then uh, Superfizz from the ETH2 Due Diligence Committee is also um, spearheading a lot of this co coordination as well. Um, so please, I mean, like, go contact them, and then that would be some great ways to kind of get started and contribute. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's public and private interest in here. I think we're all in the same boat towards kind of developing Ethereum 2 and getting getting to that point. 
Um, yeah, if you have any questions, please reach out. Thank you.